Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress. This interview is taking place at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library where it is administered by Brian Powers, who's our cameraman today. Today is the 21st of August, 2017. Uh, another historical fact about today is that the day of the solar eclipse here across the United States. But the reason we're here today is we have the honor and privilege of interviewing a Vietnam veteran, 1st Marine Division, John Michael Bier, and that's spelled B-I-E-R-E. -E. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, is, Ray. Thanks is it for okay to call you Mike? It. Please do. Yeah. Okay. You call me John, I'll ignore it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Mike, if you would, uh, when were you born and where were you born? I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, October 28th, 1946. And it doesn't seem that long ago, but it is. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, where were you living when you were born, Mike? Gosh, uh, I want to say, well, I think it was Avondale yeah. when I was a kid. And then we moved around quite a bit. Uh -huh. Wound up, uh, and, and when I went to high school, I, would, I lived in Winton Place, but I went to Aiken High School, and I was in the first graduating class in 1964. That's high school? Yep, that's high school. What grade schools did you go to? Oh, I, I, I went to, uh, Mount, we lived in Mount Healthy for a while. When I went to kindergarten there, I, I had a citywide search for me because I decided I didn't like school and I left and nobody could find me. And they had the police all over Cincinnati looking for me and when my, they, my dad came home from work, they found me in the backyard in the sandbox playing with, my, with uh, toys. <laughs> then we moved to Winton Place, and that's where I went to the rest of my elementary school. And what, uh, what school was that? Winton Place Elementary. Winton Place Elementary. Old brick building, yeah. yeah. In high school you went to? Aiken. Aiken. I went to Hughes for one year. Uh -huh. they, they had kids out of Schwab, and they split the kids from College Hill in that area and went to Woodward. And Winton Place Northside kids went to Hughes, which was not fun. And then they built Aiken, and they re recombined us in 1962. We didn't have a graduating class, so uh, we were the top class two years in a row. I see. So, and the year you graduated was 1964. 1964. Uh, what did your father do for a living? He was an accountant, and actually, ironically, he was uh, he lost his job thanks to computers, and he wound up working in electronics the rest of his life, just puttering. Uh, what was your father's name? It's John John Albers Bier. Uh -huh. And uh, your mother's name? Pardon me. Willa Neely Beer. So we were a combination of French and Irish. I the see. family joke always was we didn't know whether we had to fight or run away. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, was your mother a, a stay-at-home mom, so to speak? Or Pretty much. She would have little part-time jobs. That she passed away when I, was, when I was young, so my father remarried. I see. And uh, I had a nice stepmom. All right. And what was her name? Violet. And her maiden name was Kleinhitz. Kleinhitz? Yep. And she passed away just a few years ago. My dad died 25 years ago, so. I see. And what company did your dad work for? He worked for Grody Manufacturing most of his life that I knew. Like I said, then they, they phased him out for computers. And uh, after that, he just did odd jobs in the rest of his life, so. I see. And your brothers and sisters? Not, I don't have brothers and sisters. I was an only child. I was born very late. Uh, my mom and dad were, were roughly 40 years old when I was born, so. I see, I see. Um, after high school, um, did you partake in any sports while you were in high school or anything of that nature? I was a swimmer, and then I decided I'd like girls more, and I, I started playing guitar. So I've been a musician, closet musician, up until this day. And you play a guitar? Yep, play and sing. I play in a trio, and I do solo work, so yep. What trio do you play with? It's called New, the current one is called New Brew, and we play places like Kenwood Country Club and stuff like that, so it's, it's fun. What type of music do you play? The 60s rock and roll, mostly. Yeah. That's what we grew up with, so that's what we do. Uh -huh. Are these friends of yours from childhood or something? No, just people I've accumulated over time. I've been in and out of a whole bunch of bands, so uh, this is the latest combination, so. Mm -hmm. And it's fun, it's, it's a great little hobby. Yeah. Now, my, wa my wife keeps asking, when am I going to stop? And I said, when I forget how to play. So. Yeah. Uh, so after high school, what did you do after you graduated from high school? Oh, gosh. I, I got a couple of jobs. I went to 
I worked full time at Philip Carey Manufacturing and I went to night school full time. Philip Carey? Yep. Mm -hmm. Old manufacturing company. And then I, I went to night school, took a full time load, and uh, I found it really hard to sustain. I, I, for whatever reason, I came up short with, uh, with my funding for the next quarter, so I wound up getting drafted in 1966 in March. And uh, and you graduated from high school in '64. '64, yeah. So I made it you know, roughly almost two years with and uh, in and what, out of school and uh, in and out of jobs. What college were you going to? Or university. I went, I went to UC originally. Uh, went right. to night school. Like I said, full time load. That, it was just really hard to do. Yeah. Yeah. But. And so you got your draft notice in 1966. Six. Yep. That uh, you're still living at home when you got your draft. No, I'm living in a in an apartment with a couple of crazy people. You know the typical thing when you're a kid and you want to get out of home as quickly as you can. So, yeah. yeah. What was the date of your draft notice? You go, or your I, I I don't. I went in on the third of March '66. In fact, my DD two fourteen is wrong because when I was in, even in boot camp, uh, they they had a guy come and talk to us about the possibilities of uh, different specialties. And they said, well, if you, if you re-up for at least one year, if not two, then we can guarantee you some. And I, and I, I, I said, what, what are they? One of them was radio specialists. My dad was a radio guy. I thought that'd be kind of fun. So I, I, I enlisted for an extra year. So on my DD-214, my date of, of service entry is wrong. <laughs> so I, wanted to, I did three. I, I, I took on a third year. I see. Uh so on March the 3rd of 66, though, you're yep. inducted into the United States Marine Corps? Yep. How did you end up in the Marine Corps if you were drafted? Well, I went down to the, we went down to the induction center, and, they, and then people always butcher my last name, and they announced on the PA system, the following 17 men report to the Marine Corps desk, and it was like sticking my finger in a socket. I had no idea, and, and they went, John Byer, they butchered the name. I went, oh, Lord, no, so here we go. Next thing you know, I, for whatever reason, the guy, hands me the papers of the 17 guys and I got my first airplane flight ever <clears throat> flying to San Diego, California to go to boot camp. And we got, they got on this bus and up till this time everybody had been rather cordial, a little stiff, and we got, we got to MCRD San Diego and this DI came on that bus who would look like he was about eight feet tall and 400 pounds. And he yelled at us using language, I don't even think I knew at that time, and we, we emptied that bus probably in three seconds and standing in all these yellow footprints. And that was my introduction to the service. And I was not prepared at all to be a Marine at that time. I, you know, when I was a kid, you played Marines, I probably killed more virtual Japanese than anybody on earth. But I, I, don't, I didn't have any grand desire to go in at that time. But, but that's, that's what it was. And so you were at San Diego. Yep, Hollywood Marine as they call it, yeah. yeah. Uh, go through your uh, your boot camp training and things like that. Was oh. um, I, I was really ill prepared just for the the yelling and the screaming, how hard it was. I mean, you know, you know, all this thing about wanting to build you into a marine. Uh, I don't think they do this anymore. I mean, you got you got slapped, you got hit, you got punched, you got yelled at, you got screamed. They they. I had kind of longish hair then because I was playing guitar and all that, so I sat in the, in the barber chair and the guy thought it'd be really funny to go <laughs> cut right down the middle and make, make both sides flop on the side. And uh, we, we, had the, our, we had the last Quonset huts, if you've ever seen MCRD, we had the last Quonset huts by the airline fence. And I don't even know how far that was. We're out by the, by the parade ground and they give you your, all your basic stuff. You weren't allowed to blouse your boots, you had the stupid looking yellow sweatshirt guys yelling and screaming and slapping and then you finally had a your duffel bag full of stuff and 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 I know they set this stuff up just as part of the training but we couldn't march more than 10 feet without having to get down to do something so finally the guy you know our DI at the time decided you're too stupid to march so we're gonna make you duck walk and we duck walked from the parade ground all the way down to the our Quonset huts and it was, you know, it was just like hell on earth. I mean, I didn't have any concept of what it was going to be like. So, you know, you, you know, the beat on your rear. We had a guy, uh, one of our, we had three DIs. I, I forget my wife's name at the time, but it was Zyferts, Overbay, and Vaughn were my three DIs. And Vaughn was recon and loved to run. And he ran us every day that airline fence. We did five miles every day. 
on that stinking fence. And conveniently next to us was the sand pit, so we got to do a lot of sand. But, uh, you know, in retrospect, I thought it's, it's the only way you're going to build somebody who's going to be a Marine. It took a long time to appreciate what they were trying to do, but it, initially it was shock. But they, they did a, a very effective job, although I, the worst part of all, and this one I'll never forget, we had been there a little over a week. And everybody's counting the days till they graduate. And our DI, our Staff Sergeant DI Zeiferts came out and said, okay girls, today is the beginning of boot camp. Because we didn't have a full platoon and nobody knew that. And they, you know, you weren't allowed to talk. In Marine Corps boot camp, you don't talk. You don't make close buddies. So you were not allowed to talk. If you talked, you got your butt kicked. And there was this audible, almost scream from everybody, realizing we hadn't even started. After, after a week or 10 days of getting beaten up, I mean, it was, I, I will never forget that as long as I, I, I wanted to cry. I really did. I probably did, and I don't remember. It was just amazing. But all of a sudden, you know, you, you know and they steep you in Marine Corps history. And, and you know, you learn, you learn how to, I, I'd never fired on anything other than a BB gun. I wound up shooting expert on the range, and you learn how to close order drill, and, and, and your body, it just the change was phenomenal. And it's weird little stuff, like uh, you, you run around with, these, with your uniform that's not the right size, the stupid yellow sweatshirt, and by the time you, you know, at some point in time they realize you're competent enough to put the rubber bands on and blouse your boots. And that was one of the proudest days of my life, and it's, it's weird little stuff like that. So they, they build you Lego block by Lego block. Did, did you make any friends? Uh, this 17 guys with you, they were from Cincinnati? Yep. Um, I knew, I, I actually, one of them came from my neighborhood, a kid named Keith Gerhardt, and before I made it out of training camp, he had been over to Nam and already killed. And he mm -hmm. was killed right away. I didn't know him that was well. a nice young man, but you know, when, you, when I go to the wall, uh, it's one of the names I look for. I see. Nice kid. Uh, and any other buddies that you made were in the original 17 group? No, uh, no, no. After boot camp, every, you know, it was just everyone was scattered. So, how long does boot camp last? Man, I'm I'm, I'm trying to. It was supposed to be 16 weeks, and I think they cut it back to 13, plus the extra seven to 10 days. I mean, it, it's funny. The timing is a blur, you know, because you you don't talk to people, you don't do very much. Um, the the funniest thing I remember, if I'm taking too long, stop me here, but in San Diego, the, one of the things you had to do was get, get your dental stuff checked out. And we're standing in formation, and this is like day three or four. And the protocol in the Marine Corps was to say, sir, pri you had to start with sir, you get, that was out. Sir, private, whatever your name is, platoon 364, request permission to speak to the drill instructor, sir. If you said you, DI would say, you as a female sheep, do you want to, you know, and all, so you go through this whole mess. So we're standing out in formation for a long time, and by this time half the guys had to pee. We had to run up and say, sir, private beer, platoon 364, request, you know, had to go through this whole ragged dag to get permission to go to the head. And I watched these guys, and every guy that ran up there screwed it up, and they were doing jumping jacks forever, or push-ups forever, or all this goofy stuff. It looked like a it looked like a circus. And I sat there going through that whole pattern in my head, and I got it down right. And I went up and went it, did it perfect. We had this huge DI a guy named Overbay. He was like six five, six six. He was the one. He was a slapper. But I got through the whole thing, and I turned around and Zeiferts, who looked like Robert Conrad, was our staff sergeant DI, sharp as a tech. Drove a little sports car, kept kept himself immaculate. I turned around to run to the head and I knocked him right on his ass and ruined his uniform and there I am out there peeing with the rest of them in my uniform. <laughs> I, I will never forget that. It just, it's funny stuff like that, you know. So, so anyway, that, that was boot camp and I, I graduated in, um, oh gosh, end of May, I think, end of May, early June and um, because of my extra year I wound up going to communication school. That's why you re, uh, re yeah. up for an yeah. extra year, okay. Which was ironic too, because the gear that they trained me on, we didn't use, but that's another story, so. What did, what were you gonna be trained 
on VHS and uh, VHF and SHF radio special gear. Very sensitive stuff. And we went to went to Pendleton. We went to ITR's Infantry Training Regiment. Uh, you know, just to learn the basic grunt stuff and fire all the weapons and all that. Then I went to specialist school. And that was where? That was in Pendleton. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that was, spe specialist school was, I think it was five weeks, five or six weeks, whatever it was. Now, what does that training mean? Uh, that you? Well, you had two different types of gear. One, one was a large unit that would actually be in the back of a truck. And the other was field portable to be able to do things like communicate between, uh, let's say, if you're in Vietnam in Da Nang, the Air Force, and the and the Marine Air Corps, and and guys out in the field. So you'd, you'd be expected to be on top of a high hill or a mountain someplace to communicate. But there were several large boxes, and that was very cumbersome to to lug around. So. And they were the uh, nomenclature form was what? It, well, it's it's a it was a trek. Track 27 Bravo, and the other one, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, to be honest, because I never got to work in it. They trained us on it, never got to touch it. How long was that training then? It was, it was five or six weeks from what I okay. remember, yeah. And then what happened with you? Well, I got, got to go home on leave. That was the best part of it of all, you know, finally. And then, uh, then I was sent to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and just slummed around until, uh, well actually it was, I was there and then we had a, a Caribbean, what they called a show of force, that would have been in May of 67. And we went from May until roughly September, literally doing things like going over the side on the ladders and going in the ships and landing on Vieques and all this fake stuff. Almost like, it was like World War II, I mean they hadn't, they hadn't uh, advanced past that point. So we did, we went over the side and the ladders a whole bit in the landing crafts, and uh, it was it, it was fascinating to me. So we had this very creative captain in this company I was assigned to at that time, and he commandeered a sugarcane train, and we went across Puerto Rico for this field exercise. And we had the red side and the blue side and all that stuff. We were either the red or blue, I can't even remember, but we came in where they were not expecting us on a sugarcane train, captured the other guys won the day, we're sitting in this valley in Puerto Rico and we hear this noise coming. And little did I know how I would, I would appreciate these guys. Here comes an F4 Phantom down this little valley. He's not even 100 feet over our head. I mean, there are trees all the way up the side. And this guy goes through that valley and did a barrel roll. And it, it, just, it just stunned me. And one of the guys with me was, was a vet who'd been back and he said, um, when you go over, you're gonna appreciate those guys. Little did I know at the time. So that was the, the stateside duty. Then I got orders for NAM in October 67. October 67? Yep. And um, how did you get to Vietnam? Well, Continental Jets. Flew Con to- flew Continental to, Airlines? Yep, flew to LA, flew to Hawaii, and then flew in. And one of the, one of the most amazing things, we're on this plane, they're probably all Marines, maybe 10 Army guys. So we were flying in the Pacific and the guy came on, the captain came on and said, we have mostly Marines on the plane. He said, I'm gonna give you guys a treat. He said, we're not making much headway anyway. So he dropped down and he flew over Iwo Jima. And you could see it. And we were, I don't even, I don't know what the, what the altitude was, but it was maybe 10,000 feet, maybe less. And you could still see landing craft you there was just, i mean you could see maybe three patches of green and it just and i i the, my reaction was i don't know how any man lived through that battle you know you could see enough terrain i mean there's nowhere to run nowhere to hide you could see suribachi the whole bit mm -hmm. but i remember thinking i wish he had shown that us on the way back yeah <laughs> not, not on the way over but you know yeah. so where did you uh uh, land or disembark at in Vietnam. Okay, landed in, in Da Nang, and, and I remember that. And, and the re reason I remember the jet, you know, you're on the commercial airline, you're thinking of, you know, cold drinks and all this other stuff. He got within range, and he came in like a bat out of hell, and he dropped down fast. That big jet, and you could see Hueys, and you could see jets taking off and all this. And I mean, and, and nothing really prepped you for that. Even the guys that came back, you know, they 
they said, until you know where you're going, it doesn't do any good to, to talk about it. I don't want to scare you out of your wits before you get there. But we came in like, like nothing, landed in Da Nang, and they opened that door, and I remember, and it was like walking into a furnace. It was the hottest place I had ever, ever been in my life. You go down the steps and into this Quonset hut, and they had one little fan ticking away, and I, the guy looked at my, it was, I, 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 from what I remember as a corporal, and he looked at my MOS and he said, what the hell is that? I rattled it off. He said, we don't use that here. He said, oh, communicator. So they sent me out in Fifth Marines as a radio operator. And uh, as I recall, Dick Karen, who comes to our veterans group, was a Fifth Marine. Fifth Marine. And yeah. uh, he, was a, he was a high school coach at Aiken when I went to Aiken. Oh, was that right? Yep. And. Uh, Got to talking to him and this veterans organization we go to, and it was funny because we realized we we're in the same outfit, just twenty something years apart. Yeah. So, and I got my first helicopter ride and and out in the bush, and uh, that was the beginning of the tour. Now you were assigned uh, to the First uh, Marine Division, Fifth Marine Regiment, Fifth Marine Regiment, and uh, H Company. H Company, yep, Hotel Company 2-5. And uh, the 2-5 signifies 2nd? 2nd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, yeah. yeah. And uh, they had a long, very noble history of things like the canal and, uh, and Iwo, and uh, we, were, we were there for the Way City. Mess. I mean, you know, I got bounced around a bit, like we were mostly out of Fubai in Vietnam. That's where they were sort of headquartered, but things were fluid. You know, there was, uh, we spent a lot of time in the, what they call the Ashau Valley. Uh, we were back near Fubai when, when the Tet Offensive broke out, so we were the closest unit to be able to send in, into Way City at the time. Now, um, the Tet Offensive happened in January, January 68. of 68. Yep. And now, are you, are, do you have a permanent station, place where you're positioned, or are you out in the bush most of this time? In and out of the bush. You know, you go, you go back to the rear, they'd, they'd string a couple of lines of concertina wire, and then you'd get a lot of beer and a lot of orange pop. And I rem it's funny, because I, I remember drinking more orange pop than beer, because you know, it just, we came back once, and, and, I, and I couldn't tell you the date of I had, this is way after Tet, but it was, you know, one of those 125 whatever it was degree days, and I and I drank so much orange pop I threw up, and I went back and drank some more. You know, just it, 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 it's it's funny the stuff you remember, like you know when the grandkids and kids talk about. It. I don't I don't talk about the fighting stuff. Um, it's not just something you feel comfortable talking about. It, it was not pleasant, it's scary, and you know that's. They always talk about combat, you know, being, you know, hours and hours of sitting on your rear doing nothing and then two minutes of terror. But I remember my, my son pressed me once and, he, and, and, I, and I said, the, the best way I can put it, getting shot at is like sticking your finger in a light socket. You know, you, you, there's so much adrenaline and so much fear initially that, you know, you've got to will yourself to move. I think most of the guys you talk to that have been shot at will tell you the same thing. Now, where were you when the Tet Offensive started then? We were, we were right outside of Fubai, so we were very near Way City. So we, you know, a few miles up the road and we were in Way City. And we'd, we had visited, uh, we got a little bit of time off and, and a buddy of mine was a truck driver. And it was, it was probably two weeks before Tet. He said, hey, I'm gonna, gonna do a run up there and ask our, our lieutenant. He said, sure, if you, you know, just make sure you take your weapons and all that. So went into Way. It's the first time I've been into Way and it was just beautiful. That ancient city and just, just a gorgeous, gorgeous place, you know, with the university and all that stuff. And uh, then, you know, roughly two weeks later, we were tearing it apart. And the, uh, because of its position in Vietnamese history, the, the, the rough thing for for us was they were not allowed to use the jets, they weren't allowed to use artillery, they were trying to save as much of the city as they could. Mm -hmm. And they finally had to break down because you just couldn't get, couldn't get through without it. But it was cold and it was wet and it was nasty and just endless noise for days. You say it was cold, we always picture Vietnam as being oh, hot. Man, you get cold. In the rainy season, you get cold. I mean, 
<coughs> pardon me, the worst thing is, you know, you get wet and you never get dry. And, you know, I had a helmet on all the time and I still remember, you know, it, it's like all of us like to keep our hair as long as we can. And when I took my helmet off, I had it on so long, most of my hair came out. It looked like a toupee in the bottom of that from some jungle rot thing. Yeah. I was terrified it would never grow back. It, it, ne it never grew back as thick as it used to be. But yeah, it, was, it, it could get cold. Now, are you involved in, in the uh, building to building? In, um is it like we see on some uh, newsreels? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it was, you know, it, prior to that, most, most of the time you get shot at from a distance and by the time you get there, they'd be gone. They were, they were just, you didn't see people face to face. Now all of a sudden, you know, there, there are people that are not going to move and you're in a, a real city, house to house, door to door. And, uh, you know, the, there, the whole thing was so fluid, you never, you never really knew where, where incoming was going to come from. One minute that, that thing over there seemed safe, and at nighttime they'd come back and re-infiltrate. So it was a, it was a mess. Were the, were the uh, North Vietnamese there using artillery or anything? Or was no, no, there? no. It was, it was small arms fire and a lot of RPGs, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but again, you know, they were, if there was a, a long, narrow street, that's why we wanted things like tanks and stuff in there, because if you had to go down the street, they'd be well positioned at the end of that street, and just like, you know, just shooting, like a shooting gallery. Mm -hmm. So they finally got permission and started, and then, you know, and you look, I've got very few pictures, obviously, but I did have a, an old stinky camera with me, and I've got one shot of one of my buddies running through the Citadel wall. I've got like two shots of that, and how I, how, what made me take the picture at the time, I'll never know. I guess I just wanted to have a picture of it. I thought this, I didn't think this was really cool. <laughs> but, so that was, I mean, that was, I don't want to call it the high, I mean, it was, it was the low light, really, of, of the tour. Um, the thing that has angered me forever is because of the Cronkites and people like that acted like we lost Tet. Yeah. And we absolutely kicked the ass of the Viet Cong. They never, never functioned again really well. It did pretty much a pretty good number on the NVA. But you bring up an interesting point there. There were different enemies uh, or, or nomenclatures for them. You had Viet Cong. You had the uh, North, North Vietnamese Army. Army. Yeah. And the N you know, the NVA, I mean, it, even like today, when we see what's going on today, you know, we, we don't lose a war when we can identify the enemy. And the NVA wore uniforms, these weird little pith helmets and stuff, and this kind of weird olive green uniform, and you knew who you were fighting, the Viet Cong. Now, luckily, as a Marine, we were up in what they call I-Corps, which is up north, not quite to the DMZ, but up there was mostly NVA. So there wasn't a whole lot of doubt about who you were fighting. I always felt sorry, for you, especially the Army guys down south, because, you know, the the Viet Cong would be maybe the local farmers, you know, the old, the old thing of farmer by day and terrorist by night, and, uh, you know, just wearing any weird uniform and uh, weren't into pitch battles, you know, quick quick ambush and run. Now, the NVA, they were tough, they'd stand their ground. What weapons were you firing while you were there? Oh, well, it, it, it depended. When I got there, I had, I had an M14 for two weeks. And they made me switch over to an M16, and to this day, I can't stand it. We went from what I considered a real weapon to plastic. Mm -hmm. They'd had the situation just, I think the year before that, we had all the jams and stuff where guys would, were, were, were found shot with a ramrod down the barrel trying to clear the gun. Ours still did not function that well. They get dirty and they were really a mess. So if you could get an AK-47 and keep it, not all outfits, but our, our captain would let you use an AK. But you had to be really careful. You know, their, their ammunition was just a little, little teeny bit larger than ours. So they could use their ammunition, they could use ours. You couldn't do it the other way around. Right. Very clever. Then the color of the tracers were different. You had, you'd be an idiot if you fired off one of their magazines, you know, with tracers in it. Track and, right. Yeah. <laughs> If, if, you, if, you, if you pick one up and start shooting, and let's at nighttime you see green tracers go out, well, everybody in your outfit's going <laughs> to blow you away. So <laughs> oh, okay. you had to be very selective about that. Yeah. But, 
But um, they, you know, you'd, you'd see everything. I even um, I have a picture of me with a grease gun. And I and, it, and it's you know looking back, I, I was trying to prepare for this interview, and I thought I don't even remember where I got it. I didn't use it in in a battle, but you know we picked it up somewhere. Somebody had a grease gun, and I'm sure it was the other side. Those were all from World War II. Yeah. Oh, you'd see all yeah. you'd see Springfield, you'd see anything from the other side. Grease guns, all, and even the uh, the South Vietnamese Army, they had a mixed masha stuff, and I. I always felt sorry for them because, you know, we had our, like, in the, the Army had their big deal of 12 months. We had 13. You know, the Marine Corps, let's, let's thumb our nose in the face of danger, so let's go for 13 months, the unlucky 13. But you knew when you got out, if you made it back, then you're done. And these poor South Vietnamese guys, and, they, and people made fun of them, and they, you know, they were, they were there for the long haul. Yes, it was their country, but they were very poorly led. Now, did you have South Vietnamese uh, fighting with you? No, luckily not. We, we would be adjacent to them a little bit, but not really a lot of interaction. Um, some Korean Marines, and they were kind of, they were nuts. But, I mean, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the long haul, we were, we were pretty fortunate. We had, we had tremendous leadership and, uh, you know, just put in some unfortunate circumstances. But. Mm -hmm. But I'm 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 glad that I served. I'm proud of it. Uh, wasn't crazy about the treatment when I got home, but uh, we all suffered under that. So now, um, have you stayed in uh, contact with any of your uh, buddies that you served with over in Vietnam? One guy for a while. It's it's funny because you know by the time I went over, you were we were all replacements. And after a while, you realize you, you know you, you you have an aversion to making friends because they kind of go away, they disappear, they get killed, and you and you would lay down your life for these guys, but you didn't you didn't buddy around, you know, and you weren't back in the rear drinking, so you're in in nasty circumstances. But I had a guy named, and I wish I had kept in touch. Uh, Tom De La Fuente called me out of the blue years ago, and. Uh, I got really angry on the phone because I saw Tom De La Fuente go up in flames from a na napalm attack. And they hauled him out of there and we were told he was dead. And he was probably my closest buddy at the time. Well here he had been in VA hospitals for years and was here for some training thing and decided to look at how he found me, I don't even remember. but. But I went to, he was at one of the hotels down here, we went out to dinner and he looked after years of rehab looked like a gargoyle and was and, it, and he had just emerged to actually be seen in public and uh, was horribly horribly scarred but I, you know, I like so when I people were so anti-war by the time I came home and then I moved I moved to California I just I didn't want to deal with it anymore were, were you involved in um, any areas where Agent Arms was used a little bit in the Eshaw Valley, went, went on the fringe of one of them, and I don't think we had much exposure. I mean, I've never shown any effects, but what was startling is it killed everything. Plants, insects, birds, monkeys. Um, I, I met a guy that was a neighbor of my father's for years who finally wound up passing away from Agent Orange, and they finally admitted some culpability and he got some compensation. But this is, you've been out, I forget, probably 30 years. But uh, glad I wasn't. After, when was your tour up then in Vietnam? Uh, it was up in October 68. And Actually, I'm sorry, it was no, I, November. Because I, I came home, I got out on November the 8th. I came back, they landed us at El Toro Air Force Base, and I want to say the 4th of November, 4th or 5th. Where did they land you at? At El Toro Air Force mm -hmm. Base, near LA. How'd you get back from uh, Vietnam? Well, big jet from Okinawa, but um, when you know, Johnson had called a bombing halt and they couldn't get the big jets out of Da Nang in, no in late October, November, so I got to fly a C-130 back to Okinawa. And that was the other sobering thing to me. So I mean, you're hanging in those stupid little those little seats in the thing with maybe four or five other guys, and the whole back of the plane was full of caskets. Mm. And 
you know, one of the guys was whining, and it was cold, it was nasty, and it was noisy, and the other one kind of slapped and said, you know, you want to be back there, or would you rather sit here? And I tell you, that was a long airline ride. That was a long trip. I don't remember how many hours, but just sat there very cold and very noisy and just thankful to be there. And from Okinawa, how did you get to the States? Well, I, I want to say I, I want to say a Continental Jet. I'm not sure. I stayed I stayed hammered from the moment I landed until I got on the plane. I remember very little of Okinawa. I, I had about three other guys I hung out with, and we just stayed. We were so happy to be to be back. We stayed literally drunk for three days, and I I don't remember anything. I remember when we when we came back. I, I was I didn't know it, but in several months I was going to move to San Francisco, but the first view of the states was San Francisco at night. And everybody on that plane cheered. It was a wonderful sight. Now, so you're going to land in San Francisco? No, we just flew past oh, it. Oh, flew past but it. But the pilot came on and said, yeah, you see the Golden Gate Bridge and all this from here. It was the first view we saw on our way to L.A. So are, when you land in L.A., do you, you land at a civilian airport, of course? Nope. Nope. Oh, you did. No, they they'd had a a situation where that one grandmother who shot the the kid coming down after the end of his tour. She'd gone a little wacky, and her grandson had been killed in Vietnam, and some grandmother went up and killed killed a kid coming off the plane. So they got special permission to fly into El Toro. We flew into El Toro on a civilian jet. I wasn't aware of that. Um, yeah, they were not letting at that time. They were not letting anybody land commercially. And she uh, was so distraught, she took it out on one of took our... Took it out on one of the guys, the first guy off the plane, some, you know, before I got home. So we, uh, and it was, it was interesting because the, uh, at El Toro, they separated you into the guys that still had a tour or wanted to re-up, and the rest of us. And anywhere from an E5 on down, uh, the, we were supposed to get some rehab interviews and all this stuff. None of that happened. But we, we just cleaned toilets for three days. And they, in our own service, the Marines at El Toro treated us like trash. I guess they were getting us ready for being on the outside. I mean, and, and even the, like this, we, I had a... What rank were you at that time? I was E4. I, I should have been Excuse an E5, me. but I, uh, I did a few things that didn't make people happy. I didn't get busted, but... I, uh, I, I pushed back against authority, shall we say. But I had, I had an E5 with me, and I think he was from St. Louis, a big black guy. I wish I could remember his name, nice guy, but he'd, he took it. And he was, a, he was another big, big, big guy, and we were in this one... We were cleaning the head, and the guy's saying, you know, I'm, I'm a sergeant, and I, I just did blah, 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 and these guys treat me like dung. And this one guy came in, with his little polished boots, and he was probably a PFC, and started give him, giving him a bunch of grief. So this black sergeant, and every time you'd, if you'd complain, they'd say, we'll lose your discharge papers. Well, this guy had had enough, so he grabbed the guy by the back of the head, and he cleaned the toilet with him. And he said, and if you tell anybody, and you try to hold me up, he said, I will find you somewhere on this base, and you will not like it. And the, the kid shut his mouth. So the last day, I mean, and, and I mean, I, I was, I'm very, very proud of being a Marine in, in retrospect, and I'm proud of the Corps. I was not proud of how these rear, rear, uh, rear echelon so-and-sos treated us. So the very last day, like two hours before we're supposed to get discharged, they brought in the LAPD to ask if anybody wanted to join the LAPD. Uh, they, after passing on all the class and all the, the retrofitting stuff they were supposed to do, and they had a riot on their hands. Yes. Uh, just that, that was it. We, everybody had had enough. So um, all the threats of holding your papers and all that stopped. And I got my papers, and I got picked up by a very good friend of mine and his wife outside the gate and became a civilian again. Who was your friend? A guy named Bill Wells. Another guitarist. He lives in North Carolina now, but he and his wife Connie, they were, they were friends from junior high school. They moved to L.A., so we kept in touch all this time. Oh, I see. So, 
The next day I bought a Triumph TR3 and left it there so I would be sure to move back to California, which I did. So After you, coming home for a while. You came home for a while. Are you single at this time? No, I'm, I'm married. When did you get oh, married? Oh, at the time. I'm in touch with now. Yeah, I was always single. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, you were single, and, yeah. but did you have any, uh, any love or, in your life? Or? No, I, the, the girl that I was dating before I went over, I mean, it just kind of got, you know, I'd been gone a while. And uh, when I came back home, saw her a little bit, and you just realized, the, the first thing you realize is everyone that I went to school with, you know, they'd gone through college and they did whatever they did, and they hadn't seen what I had seen or they hadn't done what I had done. And I felt like an old man. And I had this cute little college girl with all that stuff, you know, and when I went back to see her, I just felt like I was 100 years older than she was. And, and nobody wanted to talk about it. When you, were you in public in your uniform at any time? Uh, well, you know, to fly home, you had to wear your uniform. And I was in the airport at LA and I had a couple older vet guys, nice guys, they bought me a beer. And these two hippie punks came by and one of them spit in my beer. And when I got on the airplane, my uniform did not look too good at the time. That was kind of another introduction to the, the attitude. You know, I, I got my butt kicked, but I kind of had a good time doing it. And I just, you know, you hear about this, but you, you the amount of hatred and stuff like, you know, even walking through the airport, everyone would scowl at you. I, I, these two guys at, at this little bar place in LAX were the only two that even were civil. And people call you baby killers and, you know, kind of dry spit at you and give you the finger and all. I mean, it, it, it was horrible. And you, you can read about it and you can hear about it, but you, you were not prepared for the reaction from our from fellow own. Americans. Yeah. And this like, emanated a lot from Walter Conkright, I think, as he said earlier. Yeah, I mean, the, the media people. I mean, you know, they, um, they did such a disservice to the, to the, to the military, it, it isn't funny. Uh, the reporting was, was abominable, in my estimation. Mm -hmm. Now, our own leadership, I mean, I, I, you know, to my dying day, the, the, the whole body count thing, that was a big error because you'd take the same territory. You might, you might lose guys on the same hill seven times in four months. There was never any idea of keeping and maintaining. And, you know, the, the idea was a war of attrition and that was not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But it was well intended and uh, I think that was borne out the moment we left. What happened to the Vietnamese people and others when we pulled out I think was a horrible tragedy. But like I say, com coming home, um, I, I really, I felt like an alien for a long time. So I didn't tell anybody I was a vet. I just shut it down. If you didn't know, you'd never hear. So you bought a, a Triumph motorcycle and left no, it? No, no, a TR3 sports car. Oh, I'm sorry. Great little sports car. Yeah, yes, yes. Left it in my buddy's garage. And you came home to Cincinnati. Came home, spent some time with the folks. I worked at GE for a little bit to get enough money to to go back and I went down to Union Terminal but there were still trains there and they had a, a firm called Auto Drive Away. I don't know if you remember that or not. But they would hire you to drive somebody's car. So I, I, they paid me to drive somebody's car to Seattle, Washington. And I just, you know, I said goodbye to my folks and threw my guitar, my few things that I had in the car and I drove to Seattle dropped the car off in Seattle and took a flight down to LA and my buddy Bill and his wife picked me up again and I started a totally different uh, portion of my life. What were you doing in California? Well, w I went, Were you playing music? Or playing music, trying to kill myself to be a rock star. I worked for a Uniroyal company, uh, plant in Santa Ana, California for a while and uh, had a Ironically, I, I met two Marine buddies who were not in my outfit, but uh, I wound up letting them have my apartment when I moved away, but one guy was from San Francisco. And I hadn't been. He said, hey, I'm going home this weekend. You want to see it? I went up to San Francisco, and I, fell, I absolutely fell in love. 
and I ran into a guy named Ernie White, who was a, he was running a, an outdoor school in Marin County, California for Marin County Schools, and he was an ex-Marine, and we just kind of hit it off, and uh, I said, I, I'd, I'd love to move up here, but I don't have a job. He said, uh, would you like to work in my outdoor school for a while? So I went back to LA, packed my stuff in my little TR3, the few things I had, and up to San Francisco, and I worked in an outdoor school. Then I wound up going back to school, uh, getting my degrees in marine biology. Went to what year is this that you go into Gosh, this San, would have been, this would have been 60, 68, 69. So that's, and, uh, that's the height of their, their culture up there, wasn't it? For lack of, yeah. But I, I bought into it pretty heavily. It was, it was a fun time. You know, my grandkids want to know what I did in California, so you, <laughs> we're, we're not going to talk about that right now. Well, we won't talk about no. it here then, because they'll be watching this. Um, so uh, this, you said outdoor school, is that what you said? What, yeah, what it, was, it? it was called, it was called uh, Redwood Glen. It's still there today. It's in Pescadero, California, which is south of San Francisco. And they would take wealthy kids from Marin County and then kids from places like Hunter's Point and bring them down for a week and you know things like doing education, walking in the redwoods, campfires, all that sort of thing, and introducing. And the ecology, this is exactly the first year, the year I was there was the first year of the Earth Day. A big, big deal. So the ecological movement was coming along and all that. So uh, it was a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful gig. It was a great thing. So I did that from the fall till the spring uh -huh. and went back to school full time on the GI Bill. Where did you go to school at? Well, I started at College of Marin, then I wound up going to Berkeley, and I couldn't handle Berkeley. I just couldn't do it. And I went, finally wound up at San Francisco State. But, you know, when you think of how, how expensive San Francisco is, here I am, it's 1969, and I'm getting $175 a month on the GI Bill. So you, you take every stinky job. I, I played in all these cheesy, seedy bars. I mean, and it, it, it was a wonderful time. I had less than I've ever had in my life and probably enjoyed it more than I ever will again. It was, it was really fun. Strange time to be there. So you graduated from um, San, Francisco, San Francisco State. San Francisco State with a degree in what? In marine biology. So I, I was a diver, I did, all, I did some projects for the Nature Conservancy, worked for the Sierra Club until they became you know, the political nuts, it's a shame. I mean, it's, they've kind of lost their way, but at the time it was really a, a, a fun thing to do. And I've, been a, I've been a scuba diver since 71, so that was, that was part of that training. And it, it, it was wonderful. I, I didn't get a chance to work in it a lot, but it was a great background. So what year did you graduate from uh, San Francisco State? 74. 74? Yep. And uh, is there a, a woman in your life by this time? or? Well, I, I had a couple, and then I came back to visit my folks, and I wound up totally enamored with a young lady from Cincinnati who had a kid, so she wound up moving to San Francisco. We got married. Um, she went a little off the deep end, so I wound up moving back here. And uh, then we had a son on the way. So here now I'm stuck in Cincinnati, Ohio, with a degree in marine biology. So what do you do? So I. What was uh, what what, is, what was your wife's name? Debbie. And her maiden name? Oh gosh. None of all things. N U N N. N U N N. Yep. yep. Where did you meet her at? Uh, a friend of mine introduced us. Who was that friend? A guy named Jim Ellis, who now lives in Chicago. In fact, now. So I wind up back here with her, and I, and I can't find a job. You said she had a daughter. A, a son. Oh, so I had a stepson, yeah. yeah. And what was his name? His name was Shane. Shane. And um, we wind up back here, and I, I had this bizarre history. So I wind up, uh, I, 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 we went over to their house for dinner one night, and he said, uh, have you ever thought about working on the radio? I said, well, who in the hell would hire me to work on the radio? He said, I know a guy named Leon Lowenthal, who's passed away, but he was the VP up at, at Taft Broadcasting, and, I went, and he got an interview, and this is the weirdest thing, so I wound up as promotions director for WKRC and WKRQ Radio. 
and did that for a while. Uh, one of the guys, I, I used to do some crazy promotions. This was my claim to fame was firing Chuck Matlock, among other things. So I, I had a yay boo career. One guy said, you know, you, you're relatively well spoken. How about we try you out on the air? So for a while I was Jay Michaels on WKRC and WKRQ. Then my grumpy marine background kind of flared up. I had a little falling out with TAP Broadcasting and I wound up as a DJ on WKFI radio in Wilmington, Ohio. By this time divorced and uh, met my, my current wife, Shirley. I see, how did you meet Shirley? We well, went. You, you had a son though. I had a son. Yeah, and what was his name? It, it was had, Devin. Okay. We wound up getting custody of Devin, so. Uh, okay. I know this is this starting to sound like a story I made up. This really, <laughs> this really is true. So. so uh, how did you meet your wife then? Well, I was. In her name, if you would. I met Shirley. Um, her maiden when, name? Maiden name was Lay, L E Y. Met her in um, junior high school. And I, I, because I had lived in California, I had missed our high school graduation reunion. So she was class of 65, and I had known her. She was a cute little cheerleader and all that stuff. Well, I, was, I had a guy living across the hall from me that we were kind of buddies, and he said, what are you doing tonight? I said, nothing. I'm divorced. I have nothing, nothing to do. He said, well, I'm, I'm going to go to Aiken's 1965 class reunion. Do you want to go? I said, I wasn't in that class. He said, doesn't matter. You probably know some people there. So I crashed their class reunion and re-met Shirley, wound up dating, and then we, we got married, all because I busted in somebody else's class reunion. <laughs> so. uh, what, when did, what was the date of your marriage? Uh, 1975, August 31st, and the, 20, the 42nd is coming up, and I better remember it. It's a couple weeks away. August yeah. the what? 1975. Uh, what day in August of? 31st. Oh, the last yep. day. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, how many children did you and uh, Shirley? We had one. We had a daughter named Tia, and she still lives here, and she has three, three boys. So I had three grandkids. And my son lives in Lorraine near Cleveland, and he has a son and a daughter. So we have five grandkids. Right. And do you recall their names? Well, that, uh, for my son, there's Nick. And Leilani, they call her Lonnie, and they they both play guitar and sing very well, and I, I love it. Then the three locals we have, our oldest is Julian, who's going to go to, to Mount St. Joe this year. We have Noah, who's the middle one, who's 16, and we have Elijah, who's 13. Now, either of those three play a music instrument? I've musical? tried. Oh. Noah, Noah plays drums and plays a little guitar, and actually has sat in with me a couple of times that I've done solo work. The other two I've tried and I've given up. They just, they don't have it. They just can't do it, so. Now, did your uh, wife Shirley work anywhere? Or yeah, anything? she worked at IBM as well. I, I would, in fact, she got me an interview at IBM years ago. That's how I wound up working at IBM after the so service. From, uh, from up north here in Cincinnati uh, at that little radio station, were you there when you went to work for IBM? Oh, no, no, it, it, it goes and goes. I, I finally, I wound up going back to graduate school at UC here to get my master's degree. And I was funded, I, that, that was fully, fully covered. I did pretty well in college, so I had, I had done my research work for my PhD, but I realized that people weren't getting jobs, they weren't getting tenure. The only job I could possibly get would probably be on a research vessel, and my wife said, if you think you're gonna be gone for two years on a ship, you're crazy. So I worked actually for Kroger as a, as a plant supervisor on State Avenue. I didn't know what to do, and she worked at IBM at the time. 1212 State Avenue. Uh, yeah, whatever that, whatever that was down there. Yeah, the old, uh, you know, they, yeah. the, the, they did uh, coffee and peanut butter and all that, so. Mm -hmm. She worked for IBM, and uh, we had our daughter on the way, and I said, you know, I, I really would like to get a, a real job, so she gave me an interview Somehow I talked to a guy into getting an interview at IBM. I still had the, the, the beard and the ponytail, the whole bit. And I came down to the 580 building for my interview and I, I get in and I, I didn't have a suit. I, I'd never owned a suit in my life. So I kind of clean, cleaned up a little bit and they took me up to the third floor and uh, their branch manager came out and he saw me and he's, 
oh, I'm so glad you came, and on and on and on and on. Here he thought I was part of building maintenance, and he had me moving desks around. So the guy I was supposed to have an interview with came out and said to my <laughs> wife, where the hell's your husband? She didn't know. And she sees me pushing chairs down the hall. So I go in to have an interview with this guy, and I realize this is going nowhere. You know, and, and all that, and I'm not sitting, I'm not, I didn't have that IBM look, and they said, uh, well, as, as part of the deal, we, we would like you to take the data processing aptitude test, the DPAT test, if you would. And I can tell he wanted nothing to do with me, so I sat down, it was one of these little logic tests. I wasn't taking it seriously. I thought, this, this thing is over, but you know, I wanted to make my wife happy, so I took the DPAT test. Well, it fell right into my wheelhouse of how I think, so I aced the test. They never had anybody ace it before. So they called the next day and offered a job. Said, but beard's got to go, ponytail's got to go, and you got to buy a suit. Did they tell you that? Yeah. I said, well, how much are we talking? And he rattled off a number, and I thought, okay, beard's going to go. <laughs> and and I, worked, I worked on and off for IBM three different times, and I found I, I just had, a, I had a, a knack for computers. I worked most of my time in, in software, so I went, like I so said, with an international job and did, did pretty well. And um, did that until December of last year, December 2016. I finally hung up the calculator and all that. And how long did you work for them then? Uh, on and off for 38 years. But I worked for I worked for two different businesses. I left three times, went back twice. Oh. My last job was with a company called Rocket Software, which is a big IBM partner out of out of Massachusetts. So I always kind of hovered around the IBM plane, and they were very good to me. I mean, they really they. they They've changed a bit over the years, but it was it was a pretty good deal. Did your wife retire from IBM? Oh, she she quit early. Yeah. She stayed home and with the kids and, okay. and with the grandkids. So, and I'm I'm just delighted I made the kind of money we could afford to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brian, do you have any questions? Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Uh, so when you were in high school, did you feel like you were probably going to be drafted, I mean, or did did your fellow students? I mean, what was in your senior year, how did you, how did everybody in your, in your class feel like about the draft? Well, it's, it's funny, see, th this would have been 64, and back then, Vietnam really hadn't kicked in much till 65, it was just kind of starting. Now, I had a very good friend of mine, Dave Law, that unfortunately I've lost track of. Now, Dave dropped out in his junior year, joined the Army, and was one of the very early Green Berets, and he had done a tour in Vietnam and came back, and we were hanging out a bit. And he was trying to tell me, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And there wasn't all that much big flap about Nam at the time. So when, you know, high school, there was very little conversation about it. Uh, if it came up at all, people were going, you know, didn't know where it was, couldn't point it out on a map. A couple little things in the news, but it wasn't that big a deal. By the time you got drafted, did you feel like you knew you were probably going to go to Vietnam? You know, yeah, and, and until I went down to the draft thing, I mean, I, you know, that it was starting to really escalate in 66. But again, I thought, well, if I'm lucky, I'll wind up, you know, down at uh, Army boot camp, put in two years, maybe get lucky. If I'm not lucky, I'll probably go over as cannon fodder and be done with it. But then, you know, then I had that interruption in my life of, oh, by the way, the following 17 guys report to the Marine Corps desk. And when, when you went in the Marines, I mean, there was no doubt you're going to Nam. Some guys didn't, but that was the whole push. Like even in boot camp, uh, with the one DI we had named Vaughn, the, the recon guy was probably of the three, the one that tried to be the nicest. And one evening brought everybody out, you know, in, in formation and said, the other guys would probably kick my butt if I talked about this. He said, uh, we're, we're, you, know, you know, by now we're, we're doing this for a purpose. We don't like any of you, we don't know any of you, but you know, you're Marines, or you're gonna be Marines, and we want to make sure that you get as prepared as you can. Like I said, and then the Keith Gerhardt, the one kid, I mean, it was six weeks. He went home on leave, and before I even got out of training, he was gone. So, that was the expectation. You know, and, and the thing about the, the Marine Corps is, no matter what your MOS is, everybody's a rifleman. And they jam that down your throat and they jam that up your butt. You know, you have to be prepared. You're going to fight. Even if you're a radar operator, that could happen, so. 
you mentioned when you when you got off the plane, it was the hottest place on earth. Do you, can you remember your first day, your first night in Vietnam? What, what oh. did you do? You know, they they put us in a, what they call a six by. Pardon me. <clears throat> went out to this little helicopter pad and they flew us up near Phu Bai. And you're in these these tents. You didn't even have a weapon yet. You know, and every every noise you hear, you think it's a Viet Cong crawling up your butt or something. It's hot. I mean, no air. It was probably you know at nighttime, probably 90 degrees. It was 120 or something the day we landed. And you're scared snotless, and you sweat. And the big deal when you when you when you're going to be out in the bush, they would not let you out in a quote real combat area for a couple of weeks. They they you know they finally gave you enough gear and stuff, and then they take you out in these bogus patrols. There's still the chance of getting shot up, but you're just you're so stinking hot. And until you lose the the baby fat and the water weight, you know we had a, a master gunnery sergeant, the only man I think in my life I've ever been scared of. He was a World War II vet, big mean dude, and he just said, you know, we it isn't we give a bleep about you. We just we don't want to see you get anybody else killed. So until you can hack it, but um, and I just more than anything, I I just you know non to me was either being extremely hot sweating my nuts off, n never getting any sleep, or being cold, and the bugs. That's what I was going to ask you, talk about encounters with uh, bugs and what kind of stuff what, what was out there when you were in the woods. Well, I mean, you know, the, big, the biggest thing there, everybody was terrified of snakes, although out in the ash owl, on a night ambush thing, down in the valley, you heard a tiger. And it was one of the most terrifying, yet one of the coolest things I've ever heard in my life. You hear that, you know, and then that kind of, and you, and you could tell where it was going, and where it was going. And I think everybody, everybody laying down aggressive is going, please, not me, not me. Because <laughs> there, was, there was a thing in Leatherneck Magazine um, sometime before that, some guy was grabbed on the leg by a tiger, and he turned around and punched it, and it ran away. But, you know, there, I know the uh, the Vietnamese. They used elephants for transportation. Um, you you would every now and then hear one. You never got to see one. But uh, but the bugs, the bugs and the snakes are the big thing. Did you ever walk in the rivers and get leeches on you? Oh yeah yeah yeah. So how do you how do you get the leeches off? Did you just use a knife or did you pluck? Well, the, the big it, it, out in the bush, you know, you didn't smoke, so they they had this really disgusting insect repellent stuff. And if you dab that on them, you wait a second, they'd, they'd plop off. Some guys would freak out and just jerk them off. Then you'd have a problem with the, uh, with the wound they'd leave. Did you ever encounter ants when you were sleeping? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had, uh, I, you know, looking back, I mean, I got a minor wound and they put me in for it. I didn't want them to put in for a Purple Heart and I never got it and I never pushed it. But we were out in the middle of nowhere and there was an old knockdown bunker and being a communicator, I wanted to have a place set my radio up and I woke up in the middle of the night and I had been bitten here as a rat hanging on. So I grabbed the rat, killed the rat, you know, and then you don't know there's rabies. So they make you go through the rabies shots until they fly it back to the rear. And I had to go through two days of that before they realized it didn't have rabies. And those suckers are painful. They give them to you in the stomach. I mean, that was, you know, were they giving you shots while you were out in, in, the, uh, in the bush? Well, they, 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 they flew me back to Fubai okay. for that, yeah. Were you getting um, transported a lot by helicopter? Not as much as the Army, a couple of times. I mean, mostly, you know, like, like, like at, in Fubai, they take you out in, the, in, the, in a truck out in the middle of nowhere. It's one little hump of a hill, I think it was called Hill 20, I can't think of the name now, but you start out there. If you're going to go out in the Ashow Valley, you go by helicopter, yeah. So you mentioned you were doing communications. What kind of what was the equipment that you had? Did you have to carry it with you and stuff? What they called a Prick 25 PRC 25 backpack radio. That was the most common. I had uh, the the track the track 27 Bravo that I was trained on. Now they found out about that and they had one one deal. This is where I, I why I didn't make E5. Had a, a fat obnoxious gunnery sergeant that never went out in the bush named Gunny Johnson. I probably shouldn't have mentioned his name, but I did. But he was just a total prick. And for whatever reason, we, he just hated my guts. So they hauled me in the back and said, they're going to put us out on a hill. There's a recon action going to go out. They're going to send three of us out, set up a tr Track 27 Bravo. And I was 
pretty conscientious. I wasn't like a, you know, a super marine, but I, want, I said, I want to check the gear out. And he gave me all this crap and said, I already checked it out. Shut up, you're going to go. They put us on the chart. We get out to this hill and we were missing some gear. So we could not support the units in the field, and I felt terrible about that to this day. So this SOB sent me out there without the right equipment, and then put me in for a court-martial later on. And I went in front of a guy named Major Light, who was a real hard ass, and talked to him. And I, you know, and I said, you know, I, I am not your best Marine, sir, I said, but I would never do anything to kill any of our guys. So he went and found out that this jerk had just sent me out there without even letting me check the gear. And he was removed and relieved, and I don't know what happened to him, and I really don't give a rat's ass. I, I'm just, but, uh, so I said, it's, it's that, that part of the Marine Corps was distasteful. Was that equipment run by, like, power, or battery power, or? They had a little, little mini generator. You, you had batteries that would last for a little while, but they'd send you out with a mini generator, but I was missing, Three of the components, I couldn't tell you today what they were. Uh, the one I do remember, though, you had this little, like a dish antenna, like you see on people's houses, and a pole we'd set up. We, we, had, a, we had one section of pole, I think it was supposed to be eight feet, it was like this big, and none of the cables to run from the, from the, uh, the antenna to the unit. There was no way to transmit, there was no way to receive, and some other things. I just remember being so stinking upset you know, I had, had an officer chew up one side down the other. I said, you know, I did not get to check this gear. You know, oh, I'm going to look into that. I thought, yeah, I mean, he was really pissed because we couldn't support the unit. I fully suspect some men died because of that. And, and I don't know, but I think that was a result of it. You mentioned that you started out with the M14, but then they, shortly they switched it to M16. Yep. What did they tell you? What was, what, did they say this is going to be a better weapon? And, and Lighter, lighter, faster, all that kind of stuff. Didn't have the hitting power, and you couldn't get it dirty. Now, at the time, you don't know. I mean, I, I, had, I had heard about them. I'd never even held. I didn't hold one until I went to Vietnam. And it was, it was literally like a Mattel toy to me. This plasticky thing, you know, and then they give you a bayonet. I thought, hell, if I ever bayonet anybody with this thing, I won't be able to fire it after that. I mean, it just, it just, it, it didn't feel like a weapon. You know, and, 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 everyone, you, you, and everyone was fanatic about trying to clean these things. You know, you take an AK-47, they, they, they'd throw these things down in the stream, pick it up later, shake it out, cock it, and they'd work. So, um, unfortunately, I, you, know, you, you know, an M14 has a hell of a kick. So you could, you could spray like a hose with a 16, but I thought, you know, in, in the Marine Corps, they tell you, you know, you're supposed to be a rifleman. You don't need 15 shots to take somebody down. You just need to be good. So, I missed that 14. I know you have a big passion for music. I was wondering, did you get access to music wire over there in Vietnam? Oh. Did you get a radio to listen to? Or, or you, you, you get back. At, you get back in the rear, and every some guys would have like a, you know the little transistor. You get a farts radio and all that stuff, and uh, not like it, you know that was that. That's a great question because it was culture shock for me. So, you know, I come back to the United States and all of a sudden we have things like uh, Cream, uh, Jimi Hendrix, and all this stuff. Uh, and it was funny, I still, I still remember the first time I heard Hendrix, I really didn't like it. I couldn't relate to his level of playing, it took a while. But things had changed so much, you know, when I was over there, I mean, uh, Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated, Martin Luther King had been assassinated, uh, you're starting to hear about the treatment of the vets, you know, and you just think, what the hell is happening to my country? So the, the return was quite a shock in many, many, many levels. Um, and I guess you were over there when, when LBJ said he wasn't going to run for re-election. Yep. Was that talked about much at all? No. Nah, you, know, you know, when you're out in the bush, you don't, I mean, we didn't have all the race stuff. You didn't have all the drug stuff. Um, I mean, it was well known. If somebody went in the rear, if, you, if you're a drug boy, that's, that, that's on you. You go out past that wire and you do anything, I'm going to take out myself. You just didn't have that stuff. Uh, you know, you knew, how you hopefully had everybody had everybody else's back. You didn't have the black-white crap. I had a good buddy of mine. I wish I had kept in touch with a guy named Patrick Nickerson out of Chicago. Funny, funny black kid, and we, we kind of kept each other afloat for, for quite a while, but 
did you uh, have any uh, times where they had like a, a USO show or anything like that? No. Nah. No. Nah. That, that was kind of a standing joke. The only guys who got to see the U.S. show and never been in the bush. But that's fine. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to haul Bob Hope out in the middle of nowhere anyway. But I would have liked to have seen Ann Margaret <laughs> before she became 100 years old or whatever she is. But <laughs> that, that didn't happen either. Did you get any, uh, like, a weekend pass at all, like an R&R? &R? I, I, I got two R&Rs. I got one to Taiwan. That was after, right after Tet. And then before... Before I came home, uh, I got I got an R and R to Australia, and I didn't want to take it. But we had a, a big big operation coming up, and a, a good friend of mine from San Jose named Tom Canty got a bill, and he said you got to go with me. So we went, and Johnson had called the bombing halt, so we got an extra five days because they couldn't fly us back. While we were gone, our outfit got shot all to pieces, and I've felt guilty about that. But I, those are those are the two breaks. Well, I'll ask you a couple, and maybe you can think of okay. them. <clears throat> we hear some horror stories about Saigon. Were you ever in Saigon? No. no. Yeah. I was curious about that. D da Nang was as close as I got. Like I so said, it was funny. We landed at the airport, and we go through in a, in a six-by truck. And you go through all these busy little streets, and you always hear about things like kids throwing hand grenades in the trucks. So everybody on that truck was just scared poopless that whole trip, but you're fascinated. You go, you know, you, you go from part of the city to rice fields to a little village and all this stuff, and it was just, it was like landing in, in, on Neptune. Yeah, but not, didn't do Saigon. It didn't even see Da Nang, really. Not, not the downtown part. Um, have you, did you, were you able to ever keep in touch with any of your drill instructors? No, I wish I had, you know? I, I actually, I tried a Facebook thing and all that stuff. I mean, they weren't that much older than we were. Right. Now, Over Bay, the only reason I would see him is if I could sneak up on him with a ball bat. He was a nasty so-and-so. The little whispering we did in boot camp, everybody, his, his nickname was Baby Huey. He was really big and he looked kind of chubby and he looked like he couldn't run. Bastard could run for hours. <laughs> So we had this, you know, we had Baby Huey, and then we had Vaughn, who was recon, so he could, he could run. Um, but Zyfert's, like, see, he looked like Robert Conrad. He had this little green MGB, and, and you could see him. His parking thing was right not too far from our Quonset huts. And the kind of, and we, we, we could just see him going downtown San Diego and picking up every baby. I mean, he was a really good, when I look at the old, the old uh, book from boot camp, he was a good looking dude. He was a really, really handsome guy. I thought, man, you know. I, hit, I got fascinated with your story there and I forgot my next question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we, we've been all over the place. Yeah. Well, I guess one of the, you know, when you came back, you did, we've had a lot of Vietnam veterans and they didn't really even talk about that they had been in yep. the service. Um, when did you start uh, you're part of a veteran group now. Yep. How long did it take to you? Do you feel like you uh, became more open about having served in Vietnam and stuff? What did you oh. feel like? Did you feel like there was a time to change, or that there was a change in your life? I, I think when the when the American public attitude changed a little bit. I mean, I, I didn't really talk about it at all until I got in this veterans group, and even then, I don't like to talk about it. Like I said, the shooting stuff and all that. I mean, people die, and it's just it's it's not that drum you want to beat. Um, I, I'm, not, you know, I'm not ashamed of what we did. I was not in an outfit that butchered people. I mean, all you, all you know, like in a history book, you know, people talk about me lie. That was really unfortunate. What they don't talk about are the, when the Viet Cong and the NVA took all the intelligentsia and the doctors and the professors and butchered them outside of Way, Way City and threw them in a, in, a, in a big open pit. You don't hear about that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, it, I, I just, I, you know, very often I, I finally got to where I tell people, you know, I, I'm a, a Vietnam former Marine veteran. 
And you, you make of that what you wish. And if you have any weird ideas and prejudices, I can't change them and I don't really care to. But I'm, I'm proud of what I did. I'm delighted that I made it out. You know, I, th <clears throat> excuse, I, I think I get choked up. I, I think of the guys that I left behind, you know, I mean, uh, they never made it past 19, 20 years old. And here, you know, I just turned 70. I thought, man, I, I've had a great life. Got to do a lot of really, you know, from radio personality and all kinds of stuff to rock musician, international fix-it guy for IBM. I mean, I've had a wonderful life. And they're still there. Sorry. No, no. Uh, when did you, you mentioned earlier that you went to the Siegel Wall in D.C. When did you do that? Was that when it first opened? Or no, I, 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 IBM did a lot of stuff in, uh, in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, and places like that. So I would go to, and it is, oh gosh, I don't, I don't even remember to be honest. Uh, I went a couple of times when I, I went for training in D.C. And uh, it really, you know, when you first heard about it, I kept thinking, this big ugly wall, I thought, you know, that's not very noble, but you see it. It's Yes, profound, amazing. yeah, profound effect. Well, I mean, and the whole, the, the whole idea of the design of, you know, number of killed, it just, it just, it just outlines that, that whole war. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I saw a few names on there that uh, I thought I'd never forget that I had because you just, I, like I say, I didn't, I didn't dwell on it. For the first 10 years when I came back, I mean, I didn't even want to think about it at all. The nobody. Um, I mean, gosh, you know, I, I came back in 68. I mean, hell, it went on till 75. So, you know, for seven more years. Mm -hmm. um, I felt ashamed in that I didn't think of the guys there much anymore. But you kind of get conditioned to do that. I just, I just wanted it over with. Well, how did you uh, come to be part of that, join that the veterans group that you're part of now? Well, a good personal friend, a, a guy that uh, went to our old church, a guy named Jim Bodmer, kept harassing me about this. I, I do citizens on patrol locally. You know, we go out and help the cops, and Jim's part of that. And he told me about this veterans group and having this breakfast and stuff. and. Went one time and got hooked. Tremendous, tremendous men and women yeah. with uh, a very substantial group of World War II guys, and those are my heroes. So it's, it's addictive. I love it. Can you, when do you meet? Where do you meet? It's the first Friday of every month at Twin Towers Retirement Facility. We, meet, we moved it to 830. So they have $8 for breakfast, and then there's always a presentation by someone. And they vary. I mean, some are better than others, and some are longer than others. And it's, it's just a, it's a great reminder of all the, all the guys and gals that served. I love it. And I thank Ray for this, because he's been so instrumental in that group and uh, does a, a wonderful job. Oh. I've got to thank you for that again, because it's, <laughs> it's superb. I, I appreciate that, believe me. It, uh, was it, uh, for a guy that, that didn't serve any combat, uh, I was intimidated uh, when I first joined, you know, because I joined the service in 1956, and uh, uh, but Tom Griffin, oh, yeah. he uh, he uh, he asked me one question, and he said, did you do what you were ordered to do when you were in the service? And I said, exactly. yes, I did. He says, well, that's all we did. And he said, yeah. and you're going to attend. And, I, I've uh, had that conversation with a bunch of the guys, that, you know, especially guys my age that were in. They'll say, why, you know, I didn't, almost embarrassed, I, I didn't get to land in country. I said, it doesn't matter. Right. It's luck of the draw. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, you, that you served, that's, that, that's it. Tom's yeah. dead right. Now, we have a wonderful group, that's for sure. Yep. And you're uh, an integral part of our group, too. Well, that's the end of my question. Well, at this point, our interview is basically over. But, um, yeah. Mike, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for allowing us to do this interview. Well, thank you, guys. And I, I wanna, really appreciate it. And I sincerely want to thank you for your service to our country. And yours as well. Thanks so thank much, Brian. Brian, thanks very much.